So I don't know why more people haven't read this book, but I just read it and I'm dying to talk about it. Uh, this is The Outsider by Richard Wright. Richard Wright. And I've been looking everywhere to find more people talking about it. And all I can find is, you know, Amazon reviews about how this is Richard Wright's mo most philosophical book. Um, some people didn't really like it. Some people said it was too philosophical and I get that, but I kind of love that shit. So I picked it up and I read it and this book is insane. Like, I don't think I've actually read a book that had me feeling so, like where I could literally see myself in the book and also kind of be repulsed by it at the same time. Um, all this is okay. So this book is basically about this guy um, named Cross Damon. He is a black postal office worker in Chicago in like 1950. Um, and Cross Damon is, well, he's an asshole, but he's a lonely asshole. He's a lonely asshole because he doesn't subscribe to any real social or political or religious, religious leanings. He's just this guy who doesn't exactly know what he believes in, but he still like will look at what everyone else is believing in and will be like, that's bullshit or that's stupid. Like, I'm not down with that. Um, and in terms of him being an asshole, he, like I said, he doesn't have any, any real obligations towards anybody. So he has a wife, I um, mean, he has three sons with her, but he's not living with them. Um, he has a mistress who's actually underage, but he didn't know he was underage. She was underage, but that's a whole different thing. Um, he got the mistress pregnant and then is basically telling her, pressuring her to abort it. Um, and then he has his mother who he does not talk to. Um, he also completely hates her, but he also, he hates her and loves her and also blames her for the emotional and psychological state that he's in. So the book starts with these three women that he has ultimately either portrayed in some way or they expected something from him that he just simply could not give because of the mental state that he's in. He just doesn't care about anybody or anything except for himself. And at times he doesn't even really care about himself. Ultimately, I think in terms of literature, he would probably be best friends with Marisol from Albert Camus' The Stranger. They even kind of have the same title anyway. Anyway. He's an asshole. <laughs> um, this man, he's very emotionally intelligent, but he's like, he uses that to his advantage to manipulate other people. So one example is his poor wife. I feel bad for all the women in this book because all of them need to be sent to therapy after meeting this man. Every single one of them that he encounters either ends up crying hysterically or sobbing. And I don't know if that's Richard Wright, you know, being in 1950 and writing this about women or whatever, whatever it is. Every woman in this book needs to go to therapy after meeting this man. The way he manipulates his wife into convincing him to let him leave the marriage without having to go through a divorce is probably the most messed up form of gaslighting I've ever read. And I'm not gonna go into it because I actually want other people to read this book, but that's just one example of how he, the book sets it up. So like, this is one example of how he uses his awareness of how other people's minds work um, in order to get what he wants out of them. And ultimately like this book, I think like would fall into the category of black existential fiction. Um, so about, you know, what your existence on this earth actually means as a person, but Cross himself isn't actually focused on, you know, what it means to be black. Like he obviously knows he is black, but it's just another lens that adds to his experience of the world. Um, anyway, he's an alcoholic. He doesn't believe in anything. Um, his wife at the beginning is forcing him to pay, um, an alimony to her that he cannot afford. At the same time, uh, his mistress is refusing to get an abortion. So he's trying to figure out how to get out of the situation. And then lo and behold, he ends up in a subway accident that, makes everyone else believe that he is dead because his uh, his identification falls onto another dead black man who looks like him. And so everyone thinks he's dead and he gives the opportunity to go forth and start a new life. And what's crazy about this book is, you know, the whole time Cross is saying, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in like divine intervention. Um, I don't believe in any type of higher meaning to life. You kind of give life its own meaning and stuff, but he's literally given a second chance at life. <laughs> 
<laughs> he gets out of the subway accident and the first thing he does is go and get a drink and think about oh man I still gotta pay my wife <laughs> alimony I still gotta figure out this um my unborn baby with my mistress and I'm just like dude like you literally almost died you would think if you almost died you would be like wow I really gotta get my life together but this guy's like nope uh, like I gotta gotta figure out how to take care of my nagging wife who has every right to nag considering what I got to her and my mistress who I got pregnant even though she's only 15 years old but that's another story anyway he finally figures out that everyone thinks he's dead and he uses that to his advantage to get away from his obligations to his wife his mother and his mistress and he goes from Chicago to New York um, to start a new life um, but he leaves a trail of murder and death in his wake and I don't want to spoil too much because I actually want more people to read this book so I can talk about it because first thing after I read this book is like I need to talk about this with somebody and that's actually the whole point of the book um Cross when he gets to New York he adopts the name of Lionel Wayne so Cross Lionel the whole time he's mourning the fact that he has nobody he can really relate to that he feels so lonely like in the way he thinks, um, even among his friends back in Chicago, he felt like that he couldn't really relate to them, that there was a gap between them that he just could not close. And I feel like a lot of people could relate to that. I think this book has probably one of the best portrayals and descriptions of loneliness that I've ever read. Um, and it's funny too, because, you know, all this whole time he's dealing psychologically with, you know, I'm feeling lonely. Nobody's really thinking the way I do. I don't have anything I believe in. Um, but the, the white people he encounters on his way to New York all kind of look at him and they think his entire psychological mindset is entirely based on his experience as a black man in America. So there's one scene where he's in a train with this white guy and the white guy is like, oh, I'm fascinated with the psychological state of black people in this country and you know, how they deal with racism and being an outsider. And the white guy is like a hunchback. So he identifies with black people um, or that's what he says anyway. And the whole time, the black guy is like sweating like that that Jordan Peele meme. He's sweating because he's worried about whether they're going to catch him for that guy he killed back in Chicago to protect his identity. And I just thought that was so funny, like how Richard Wright uses irony in his book uh, to portray that Black people are so much deeper than just, uh, just our experiences with racism. Like we do experience loneliness. We do experience depression. We do experience uh, these kind of delusions of grandeur that he experiences throughout this book. Um, and I think what I enjoyed the most was just how later on in the book, he interacts with these communists. They're trying to recruit him. But at the same time, they can't exactly figure out what his angle is. Like they don't know, they obviously know there's something wrong with him. They know he's not who he says he is, but they can't, figure out what exactly he is trying to do and why he won't just up and join the communists. And the whole reason is because Cross with his emotional intelligence can see that they, their whole thing, like whether it's communism, fascism, capitalism or whatever, all these apparatuses that are set up are done in order to have one man stand over the other. And he described, Richard Wright describes them as little gods. So every man wants to be a little god. They want another man to be subservient to them. There's this whole, system of superiors and victims that has to be in place in order for men to satisfy that kind of caveman need for power um, that's instilled within all of us. And Cross can see into that. And although he criticizes it, he also becomes susceptible to it, which is why he commits the murders that he does, both to protect his own identity and protect people from finding out the secret and to fulfill that desire within him. This whole book is about how men fall to their desires. And what, and basically like, you know, we build society, we build these kind of screens between um, our old ancient selves and uh, who we used to be, our natural um, innate need to fight, to, uh, to dominate. And we build these civilizations and societies uh, to pretend that we advance beyond that. But really these new uh, screens that we create, communism, fascism, the church or whatever, are just kind of, uh, kind of just updated versions of those old uh, scrap and tussle in the caves psychology that we used to have. Like we're still desiring to put ourselves above others to feel better about ourselves, about ourselves. And that even applies to racism, which is part of this book, but it's not about, um, it's not literally about being black in America and being black isn't discussed in a way that like, uh, 
the black people are always the victims. Um, uh, he's he's talking to uh, Eva, a white woman in this book, and she's describing herself as a guilty victim, as someone who, because she's married to this communist leader, um, she describes herself as a guilty victim, as someone who went willingly into communism and has been uh, suffering as a result. But she sees black people as innocent victims. And that's how she sees cross. Like they couldn't help how they were born, but they're so strong to deal with white racism and to still go about their day without succumbing to despair, depression or whatever. And the whole time cross is like, you know, he literally says in the book, like, you know, if everything I've had to deal with being black is like the last thing I think about um, because, and this is where like me personally, I think about this a lot too. Um, when I think about myself on a daily basis, I'm like, you know, how do I feel about myself as a person? My thoughts aren't constantly, what is it like to be black? Even though that's another lens that I view the world in um, as a black person and as a woman, I do see the world uh, through those lenses, but on a regular daily basis, I'm also just thinking about, you know, what am I going to do today? What do I think about this? Am I a good person? And that's entirely what the book is about. And I think, that is something that I have not read often um, in books, especially from uh, the 1950s, um, especially written by Black authors, just a deeper existential outlook on the world as a Black person where you are Black, but that's not all you are. And it reminds me of um, that song, The Story of OJ <laughs> by Jay-Z, where he's like, I'm not Black, I'm OJ. And that's kind of, I think that would be Cross his attitude, even though he would probably be like, yeah, I'm black, but that's, there's so much, but that's like, that's literally the last thing I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about, you know, why can I not relate to anybody? Why do I not feel close to anyone? Why do I not feel the need to be obligated to my wife or to my sons? Like what is going on in my head to where I can't fulfill the role of a husband and a father? Like what's, why am I more likely to be loyal to my desires rather than the social obligations that I actually have? That's what he's thinking about. He's not thinking about the racist white guy that called him N-word. He does not care about that at all. He's too self-absorbed. He calls it a mixture of self-love and self-hate that's preventing him from really being active in any type of social movement or any type of like social apparatus that would have him fighting for a greater meaning to life. The ending of this book, I think, was so devastating. Um, I don't want to spoil it because like I said, I do want other people to read it, but the philosophical meaning of the punishment that Cross receives at the end, I think stuck out so much that it kind of hurt me <laughs> physically because what I thought about, oh man, if I had to deal with, because another character actually, when they explain uh, why they're doing, why they're giving that sentence to him or why they're allowing um, this certain thing to happen to him. When they explain it, it just settled within me. And I was like, oh no, that really is worse than, you know, going to jail or, you know, being hauled before court or even being sent to the electric chair. What he has to endure is worse than having to go to jail. Even as a black person in the 1950s, it's worse um, on a psychological, philosophical level. And I think that's the point of the book was that you know, his own fear of loneliness, loneliness ultimately led him to this punishment. Um, he kind of ended up chasing his, his fear to its own end. And after that, I really was kind of just like shaken. I was like, damn, <laughs> damn. Um, yeah, this is probably one of the best books I've read this year. Um, I don't know. I just, I really want more people to read this book. I don't know how else to put it. I've, I've read uh, his other book. I think I read Black Boy when I was like 13 years old. I don't know why I read it then, but The Outsider, I think, is much more relevant to me as I am now as a graduate student, as someone who definitely overthinks about everything way too much. Um, yeah, this is this book is definitely about someone who thinks too much, who knows too much, who knows himself a little too much, and you know the consequences of his inability to really, you know, kind of forgo that, or if you if you even can forgo that, I don't know if you can at all. 
But um, yeah, The Outsider, I gave a 4.5 out of five stars. And I don't usually make videos on the books I read, but this one stuck out to me so much that I had to make one. So if you saw this, we got to the end of this long, unedited rant. I hope you'll pick it up. And I hope, you know, maybe there won't be so many outsiders to the knowledge of the outsider. <laughs>